I'm happy to chime in if you want me to just say, you know. <laughs> okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Deborah Hansen Conant, and I'm here with Kathleen Wiley. And this is uh, one of this blah, blah, blah. Okay, let me try. <laughs> This is blah, blah, blah. We do that all the time. Right. Oh. Okay. Hi, I'm Deborah Hansen Conant. Well, let me do that again. Yeah. Hi, I'm Deborah Hansen Conant, and I'm here with Kathleen Wiley. And we are here to talk about music and Jungian analysis. <laughs> Jungian analysis. We're both harpists, so we're calling this series Jung at Harp. And it's part of my series, series called In Between the Music. I'm a composer and I'm a performer, and I also have an online class that's called Strings of Passion that's all about looking at how music works. And Kathleen is a Jungian analyst as well as a harpist. So in this eight-week series, we're talking about the Strings of Passion, which is the seven principles of creative resonance. So um, I teach them in my class, I talk about them in my concert talk, and I also am working on a book about them. And these are the principles that take you, take anyone in any creative expression from impulse to the actual liftoff of creative expression. And so week by week, we're talking about these principles and how to bring them into our lives and what purpose creative expression has in our lives. So this week, we're talking about practice and practices. And I always think the difference between practice and practices is, I think of practice as I'm practicing to get something, to get something right. I want, I have an idea. I want to try something. I want to be able to do it. I practice to get that. I think of a practice as putting myself in a position with the instrument or with anything I'm doing so that it can get to me. And that practice, you can even hear in my voice, it kind of come, you know, mellows out. When I'm practicing, I'm trying to achieve something. And when I'm in a practice, I'm putting myself in a position to receive from actually doing whatever it is that I'm doing. And I was looking at that in a, in a webinar called Meet Your Muse the other day. And I was, I was doing something like, um, I was playing something very, very simple to try to, to, to show this. And what I was playing was something like, um, it was like, uh, I, just playing that over and over again. And I was describing that it creates almost a garden spot within us that we can go and we can be. And I think of that as being one one of the practices, maybe one of the simplest practices that anyone can do with anything is to take something simple that you love and do it over and over and over again. So that's been what I've come up with about practice and practices. How about you? Well, you know, I'm so glad we're talking about this and this nuanced difference because often when people come into analysis they're struggling with some emotional emotional state or some relational issue or some part of themselves that they want to get rid of and they want to banish it and they're like I want to help me get rid of that or I want that to go away and in truth it is the practice of being in relationship with oneself that shifts something and you know you're talking about a practice as something that's structured and this you impose it this you're this is a set order you're going to impose yourself on it and do it versus what we might call the practices is a way to distinguish as we talk about it practices which are ways of being in relationship to what you're doing and letting it impose itself on you right right that's right like yeah. And it's a reciprocal kind of relationship, which is really what we need internally with all of our states of consciousness. We need to be willing to be impacted by it and to impact it. And in fact, as long as we resist it and we don't want to be impacted by it, we're going to have a practice of controlling it, a practice of changing how we think, a practice of doing daily affirmations to keep this at bay then it's, it's like imposing ourselves on something and we don't ever get back from it what it's trying to tell us. 
So that's what I'm, I'm thinking as we're talking about practice as a structure, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to conquer it versus practices of, okay, I have this structure. We've talked about structure, mm -hmm. the structure I'm going to work with, but as a practices that will touch me as I touch it and that we will shape one another. Yeah. And I love what you just said, that it will touch me as I touch it. Yes. And that's, I think that the idea that I discovered when I got into these strings of passion and got play, playing mm -hmm. them more is that if I am in a relationship with this instrument, as I touch it, it touches me. Yes. And instead of that imposing, and I don't mean that we shouldn't practice things because I think that mm -hmm. there is always a time for um, practicing stumbling, you know, you know, like I'm going to get this. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a fun, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, or wait, I'm going to make a checklist or ha, huh, I have an idea. I'm going to make a, a mind map of this. I mean, I'm always trying to like, how am I going to understand this? And then there's the other side of it. It feels like there are two ways of engaging, not one better or the other, but you would, I, you would definitely, I would definitely be in, out of balance without the practice says of letting it touch me. Yes, because he, otherwise it's, it becomes a very robotic kind of controlled um, expression versus an alive reciprocal co-created expression in the moment. If, if I think of in the practices, we're letting the harp and the music speak to us as to how we then move with whatever our practice technique is. And in a way, it's the same with all the parts of our psyche, that when we can be in relationship with that part of us, even that part of us we detest, or that part of us that causes us problems, then something can begin to change because we are informing one another. Wow. Okay, so I think you've talked about this several times in this, about the union. So give us again, there, there's, you said inform each other, yet yeah. we're talking about ourselves, or we're yeah. talking about an instrument or, or something. So what do you mean by it taught, inform each other? Well, it's like all of our emotions, for instance, all of our emotions are messengers that tell us something. So when we get angry, it's a messenger. And our anger usually is telling us something needs to change. The problem is we then think, oh, that means that person needs to change. That outside thing needs to change. And then when we can't impose ourselves on it, then we go into a rage. Whereas the anger's message is you need to change something. If I'm angry, then it's a message. I need to do something differently. And when I can listen and do something differently, then I'm not going to move into rage. So rage is oh, because we're stuck. If, if, if we feel we can't do something, we're we're stuck. We're right. Okay. Right. So that's an example. Is that you know um, often people struggle with their anger, and you mm -hmm. know people will say, "Well, I don't do anger," and um, or people don't do anger, but they rage all over the place. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, so that's just one example, but all of our emotions are messengers to us. So if we can engage it in that, re that way and listen to what it has to tell us, then it informs our action and our movement, both our inner action and our outer action. You know? Now, when I was thinking while you were talking, I was thinking, now, when did this happen in our development? Like, where would we get the idea that if something's if we're not comfortable with something, something out there has to change. And at what point would we get an, an understanding that we have agency? Well, the sense of agency actually begins to develop from two to four years of age. You know, that's why it's the terrible twos <laughs> and parenting circle is <laughs> because all of a sudden that little cute infant now is walking and they, you know, decide they can do things independently. So actual agency starts very early. Consciousness of it and conscious use of it sometimes never starts for people. Some people go through life and die totally unconscious and just driven by automatic responses of their emotions 
and their bodily physiology in response. But once you begin to work in whatever the capacity and a lot of the spiritual disciplines and self-help disciplines really begin with starting to developing the capacity for self-awareness and self-reflection because that's the beginning of consciousness. Oh, be, when we know we're there, like, hello? When we know we're there. And when we know I'm feeling angry versus all of a sudden I'm just acting out anger. Okay. So there's we, a difference between, because, oh, wow, I'm feeling really angry about that because then I may have some choice of what to do with it versus the impulse of anger just comes up and I don't even realize it until I've said something harsh or I've done something I feel ashamed of. Wow. Okay. So I, what I'm hearing is that when we're not aware, it's almost like we're a cog in a machine. Something happens and boom, yeah. we react like yeah. this. But, yeah. when we, but when we have some self-reflection, then we can consider, actually consider for a moment. Yes. And respond, um, uh, consider ourselves and other people. Yes. And then, and then make choices about our responses, which might not be the right choice at first, but at least if you've made a choice and, and it's wrong, you're like, ah, aha, okay, I see I made that wrong choice versus just reacting and it's wrong. Exactly. Making a choice is a step in the right direction from just reacting automatically. Right. Because then you would just feel caught again because you're right. reacting. I, it didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't right. do the same thing as so. Okay. All right. So, so you're saying that practices of self-reflection, mm -hmm. what actually happens when we do that inside and how can a practice like a, a physical, like I'm really interested in embodiment of anything. Mm -hmm. So how can a physical practice, like, I mean, if you have a harp, it, it could be a harp, but it could be uh, literally, it could be the experience of clapping slowly. I mean, that's, that is a beautiful, you know, that's a beautiful thing. Even that is a practice. How does it, is that a practice and why is it a practice and how could it be a practice and how might that actually lead to self-reflection? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with intention, don't you? That if, you know, if I come to my heart to do my warm up exercises as a practice that I'm going to conquer and get just right, that's one thing. But if I come to my heart to do my warm up exercise in the sense of practices, as we're talking about it, about feeling what it feels like when my hand, my fingers go on the strings, experiencing what's happening as I pluck the string, listening to the tone and in those moments, those nanoseconds, making adjustments. So the first string I pluck, it feels clunky and it sounds a little off. So then the next string, I've adjusted my finger ever so slightly for a better tone. That that, be, that would be what we're talking about as a practice with the okay. S, because there's something happening that's mutual versus something that's one directional. Maybe that's a good way to think about it. A practice is one directional, whereas practice says, as we're using the, word, the term, is two directional. There's a, but, but practice, a flow. Practicing is just practice. I'm, I'm practicing doing something. I am practicing doing something. Right. And a practice and practices are where we're engaging with another thing. Right. And, and I love it because it makes, I mean, it brings me to like, why is this important? And one of the things I've discovered in um, that many musicians don't do or don't have a capacity for is listening to themselves as they're playing or listening to others. So playing and listening. And when we do this practice the way you described it, we are engaging in that art. Right, that's right. That's exactly right. And back to your clapping, could that be a practice? If you're clapping with intentionality and focus to experience it, and again, to, to let yourself be changed by it, then yes, it could qualify as what we're calling a practice in the sense of practices. But if you're just clapping and you're mindless and you're off at the grocery store, then you may practice whatever the you know, assignment or structures, but you're not changed by it. 
It's interesting because, you know, affirmations are so popular and they have their rightful place. But the problem with it is if you just are saying your affirmations mindlessly and you're feeling the negative feeling, it's not going to have any power. But if you're slowing down and you're saying your affirmation, visualizing and feeling into and conjuring up in your body the emotional state you want, then that affirmation has power. Okay, so if you're using it as an opportunity to open a window into yourself and actually experience your well, I'm, I want to go back to character because as you were talking, I was thinking, mm -hmm. you described the string. I was like, wow. So you're exploring the character of the sound mm -hmm. when we play like that. And when we open to ourselves in an affirmation or any kind of practice, we're exploring our character, which is the richness of who we are. That's right. That's right which is really the essence of Jungian analysis is really to get to know oneself. You know, Jung says that, um, that the psyche can have a generic manual, but every individual psyche needs its own manual. We each have our own playbook, so to speak. And part of the work of analysis is really becoming conscious of what's your soul's playbook so that you then when you feel the pull of the shoulds, must, and all twos, you've internalized from the outside world, but you feel that still small voice of your heart and soul saying, oh no, let's go this way. You understand the inner conflict and you're in a better position to align with your heart and soul than to go along with the shoulds. Or sometimes we go along with the shoulds and we say, okay, I'm doing, going along, I'm going to do this, but I'm doing it consciously. And I realize I'm going to have to take some action to remediate the energetic cost to myself. I'm saying that we just got through the holidays. So a lot of people probably did some of that <laughs> with people. <laughs> oh, Oh, <laughs> oh and, and so the remediation is then to apologize or make amends or, or, get, make or if it's a remediation with oneself, if you've been in a really stressful situation with, you know, an extended family member whom you have conflict with or unresolved negative experiences, then when you get home, you have to give yourself the space to be with your own experiences and take actions that would um, help you let go of whatever negative emotion got triggered. And you those know? actions might become your, your practices as That's you, right. uh, right. uh, so, so what is a, um, so a practice, if someone played an instrument, one practice I would recommend that they would do in any situation or recommend that I do in any situation is literally find, uh, uh, you know, a chord or two chords that you love that create a specific feeling in you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and and i think of that as a garden spot as literally being able to go to a spot in yourself or in life where you feel connected and you can do that with a sound or a, oh a absolutely yeah absolutely and you know part of what i'm thinking about that it's an easy way for me to think about it at the moment is you know um and you talk about in the summer harp jam, the different patterns of going from the one chord to the four chord to the five chord, or the one chord to the two chord to the six chord to the five chord. And each chord has a different feel. Each chord has a different state of body it comes along. We talk about the one chord is the root, the home chord, it right. feels like home. You know, the five chord almost always goes back to the one chord because the five chord is like, okay, here we're going back home. So just for people who don't know, yeah. um, you've probably heard this before. You've probably heard. That's a, that's, um, that's a, I'm going to call it a cadence because that's what they call it in music, but basically it's the end of a sentence. Mm -hmm. sentence that says and I'm going home and I'm going home and I'm going yes. home yes um, and so there's all there's in every scale of, uh, in every scale there's a home that you're in when you start and then the rest of the chords are in relationship and, right. it's, and it's really interesting because that chord like th this chord <laughs> Da, that's the chord that's called the dominant chord in this key I'm mm -hmm. playing. But in a different key, 
that would be right that would be the home and what i love about this i mean there's many things i love about it but i love thinking about it as in families yes you are you you know and your mother is your mother in in one family mm -hmm. but in another family your mother is the me and your <laughs> your daughter or whatever and so you can see that the, a person might be the same person but they're completely in a different relationship yes and i'm just realizing this is something it would have been fascinating to talk about last week when we were talking about roles mm -hmm. and i didn't even you know i haven't even thought about this about the power of what harmony and it's the, just the the western harmony i don't want to get i want to get too detailed but i do but i don't um the whole <laughs> the whole idea that all our western music is based on is so much like a family mm -hmm. in, you know in certain in a certain situation one person is dominant and the other one is homey and the other one is leading to this and then shift and it's all different right um, and i feel like that's another can of worms who has a can of worms anyway whatever that's a <laughs> Yeah. Well, we probably all have cans of worms, but anyway. Yeah, but like, but you, know, you, know, <laughs> you know, DHC, as you're talking about it, you know, part of what I've been playing with the last year, particularly for myself with my heart, is letting myself just sit down and find what key and what chord progression really resonates for my feeling state that day. And um, I often laugh and say, you know, I, my, my parents are from the, you know, Scotch Irish. And I said, I know I was starved in the potato famine years ago, you know, centuries ago. <laughs> but, um, and I love those minor keys, you know, I love. And so it's like they just, my heart and soul, I feel so present in it. And, you know, there's so much loss associated with the Scotch Irish heritage. And um, John, my husband's always saying, can't you flip some levers and make that sound happy? <laughs> and it just doesn't sound, it, it's just not what I want. I want that melancholic, heart, introspective. And you know, that's an example of where um, the uh, it practice in terms of a practice is, as we're talking about it, of getting in touch with what's what's in me that can be expressed through the music of the heart and of course in Jungian analysis i'm going to be looking at trying as best i can to to identify the feeling and put a word around it but jung said once and he said this in regarding to active imagination where we consciously dialogue with a part of ourselves. you know we do it all the time we go by the the family reunion and we say oh my god i want those brownies and immediately a part of us kicks in and says you can't have that you've got to leave you've got to fit in that show dress you know so active imagination is just where we get in kind of a meditative place and we intentionally invite a part of ourselves to dialogue with us and we listen but in writing about that process jung said what's important is that the energy shifts it doesn't matter if we know why it shifts or not but what matters is that it shifts. So using music as a creative expression and as um, a therapeutic modality gives an opportunity for things to come up and be expressed that maybe we won't ever have a cognitive understanding of, but we've had the felt experience of it that was needed for the internal organic shifting to happen. Wow, that's, yeah. there's so much you just said. I just want to respond to so much of it. Um, let, let me just go back to one thing uh, when, when your husband said, uh, you know, can you flip levers? And um, I think that um, one of the things that happens in a music practice is that we, the, the difference between what people are hearing and what we need to experience mm -hmm. often is, um, is different. And so what I often say to my students is protect yourself when you are going into a practice, make sure that the door is closed, make sure that people aren't coming in, giving helpful comments, because you're doing what you just said, Kathleen, you're there to make that shift. And it's, it's so completely different than performing. Mm -hmm. And yet you, and yet we want to bring it into our performance, 
Um, but I find that even in even my brain at first would not allow me to play the same chords over and over again, even though it was very clear to me that they were a pathway to some emotional experience. Right. And I felt like, well, I can't play that over and over. And finally, after teaching, you know, after building the school and, and seeing what people need, I began to realize, yes, you can, and mm -hmm. you have to, that's a pathway. And, and I, to either joy or sadness or sorrow or whatever it is, but to actually let myself play it until I sometimes I'm sobbing or that I'm joyful and I'm laughing or just that I feel a, a sense of, of connection and peace. Absolutely. And allowing that to happen and not trying, it's, it's so different from interesting music. Mm -hmm. And if you compose, let's just say you compose, mm -hmm. and I know you've done that around various feeling states you've gone through, then the process of composing can be a way of integrating your own emotional experience so that when you go on stage and play the piece, the emotion isn't raw to just right. come and take you over that's right. in a way that you would not want to have happen on stage. Right. That's right. Yeah. That certainly happened to me with my song, the nightingale, which is about my mother is that to sing it with complete conviction at first I had to, you know, go and let all the sadness out of it or let all the sadness that I was holding on to just kind of fill me so that I could be, there on stage with it and let other people experience what they need to experience with it exactly. imposing any of that on them that's right yeah that's right. So, so part of what in terms of practice as a imposed structure or practice as practices then part of also then as we practice for performing mm -hmm. there needs to be involved in that a, a practice as the practice says of really being with what's the emotion within oneself that is activated with the song and what of that does one need to contain for oneself and what of that then can flow into the music as you share it this is so beautiful it's reminding for what uh, years ago i went away to a shakespeare camp for mm -hmm. a month and <clears throat> when by the end of the camp i began to understand that what they were talking about was the resonance of the words i mean we did exercises and i want to describe one of them because it makes me think of what you were saying but eventually what i began to understand is it was all about resonance the resonance of our bodies the resonance of our words the resonance of our voice the resonance of our understanding of the words that were being spoken and one of the exercises that was so fascinating is that we would read um you know just a, a a, a sentence or I don't know if Shakespeare has sentences, but whatever yeah. something from, from one of his things and we would read it and there would be two people next to us. And if you, you'd say one word, like the first word might be I, and the second word, right? I, I bear thee. Let's just say mm -hmm. I bear thee. So when I'd say the first word, I, this person would say, I, is that you or is that something that you see with? I, is that yes, I, I, I? And, and they would just start speaking all the possible meanings of I and, and, and even just the words, I, ye, is it, and decide with an I, does it have an E, what is it? And then, and then they'd stop and I'd go on to bear, I'd say bear, and they were like, bear, is that, oh, ah, a bear, there's a bear here, it's scary. Oh, but I'm going to bear that, I'm gonna hold that up. Oh, you're bear, you can't be seen at all. And until there was so much resonance, so that speaking mm -hmm. one sentence might take five minutes, but at the end, there was just, so much resonance in each word and then when you get on stage that would be that would be in all of there you wouldn't be thinking about it but it would be in all there and so as there was something that you just said that made me think about the you know as we're in this practice it's this slow connection to the character and the meaning versus mm -hmm. the moment that we play it when we just kind of bring all this and into the world Absolutely. And you know, your the Shakespeare camp experience, I'm so glad you shared that, is such a great one because what they were doing is they were heightening your awareness of the state of consciousness that you wanted to convey with the word. 
right. because right. words and, and the esoteric tradi spiritual traditions, you know, words are, are powerful. And to name something was the belief was you had control over it. Thus in the Jewish tradition, the name of God is never spoken. Uh -huh. It's a very um, archaic idea. But the essence of it is what you were just illustrating that you got at camp, which is you can say I in a way that we think I, or that we think I as the self. Or you can say bear in a way that you think the grizzly, or that you think bear is naked, or bear is holding up under. But the difference is what's going on in your body. What's not what's going on in your head. What's going on, I like to say, in your body-mind, which well, is, yeah. And as you were saying that, I was thinking that <coughs> from going through that exercise, if I said the word bear, I might actually, even though the word I'm bearing something and I am bear, I bear mm -hmm. myself, I think they're completely different words, but I might hold them both. And they might have a poignancy. And this goes to what you were saying about, you know, there's a collective meaning or there's, you know, there's a meaning. And then there's a meaning for each individual. And that's, that's right. the richness that we bring. That's right. Wow. So what I'm seeing is that, mm -hmm. is that these practices let us bring more of ourselves in, into and through and so we're taking our place in the puzzle of human expression that's right. uh, we're filling filling the mosaic uh, in that resonance so um, oh so there was one thing i wanted to go back and ask you um what kind of oh right so when we're you said that the the moment what you're looking it doesn't matter what the practice is the moment is when you it's all about making that shift allowing yourself to make that shift letting the thing Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm saying it, I'm thinking, letting enough of something else into you or engaging enough with something else that you allow yourself to be changed or opened, opened up, parts of yourself to be opened up a window. How, so let's say I sit down, and I'm, that kind of is a dumb question maybe, but I just want to ask it. I sit down, I find a chord that I really love. How long do I play that? However long feels right. <laughs> I can tell. No, I knew that was going to be. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, so, so let's say somebody's really struggling because they've got a lot of voices in their heads, and the voices are in their heads, and so it's so. What what are their steps? Um, like I'm playing. The, I found a chord. Um, I love. No, not that. Okay, I like this one. I like that and I like alternating it with this. So let's say all kinds of stuff is going on in my head, like, um, am I actually, oh, did I, oh, my finger, oh, my, okay. So I'm thinking something like that. I'm thinking something about my body or I'm thinking, oh, oh crap, I played the wrong note. <laughs> what, what, what is a, I mean, I would tell students, use that as an opportunity to let go, let it go. Keep mm -hmm. moving with the music. The music is moving on. The music is not the notes. The minute you set this into play, and especially if you set another thing against it or with it, that is going. And so you need mm -hmm. to let go of anything else you do and just keep jumping back in when you can. Yeah. Go with the flow. I mean, I think that's, you, you go with the flow. And again, so what, is the flow? what is the flow? For, for, from a perspective of Jungian analysis, yeah. it is the flow of your own soul. It is the direction that your own psychic energy, libido, life force wants to flow. So how do you know, especially if you're all, met, you know, stuck and stuff. How do you know? I mean, I get this. This is why, this is why there is Jungian analysis, but yeah. How do you, like, yeah, how do you know your flow? How could, how could you find your flow even in like one tiny little moment in a day? Um, what I always say to people is I ask, have you ever had an experience where 
everything just felt right to you. You felt in alignment, you felt at peace. It's like you had that moment of everything's in divine order is how I would say it. Yes. You know, we know these things. Now, I think the, the maybe a bigger question or a question before that is how do we calm our central nervous system down and still our mind enough that we can hear that or feel that state okay all right so i what i think i hear you saying is that's in us all the time it's all and, the time and we're just making all it's almost all and what i'm seeing is this water and we're just like flapping around yes. at the top of the water and so we can't actually experience that yes that's it exactly and so a lot of what um what Jungian analysis helps people do is deal with all of the flapping, which usually is happening, happening because somewhere there is a learned belief, a learned pat an internalized pattern of behavior that is actually in conflict with one's own nature, with one's own soul. So often the flapping of the water to use your image is happening because um, one is internally in conflict. And we have this penchant in our culture to not want to bear conflict. We just want to medicate it and make it go away. And we have to be willing to take up our conflicts. We have to be willing to say, okay, a part of me wants a day a week to write, but another part of me wants to continue with my practice my professional practice because I have these other things that I want that that gives me and there's a conflict so I can get all in a flutter or I can sit down and say okay here I have this urge for this that's very still and quiet and then I have this outer reality and I can get in a real twitter about it um or swivet as one of my <laughs> my friends says I can get in a swivet about it you know and just go the flap which people go through their day all the time like that right. or i can sit down and say okay well yeah i do have this conflict and today my schedule set so i'm over here now what am i going to do to make some space for this over here i think musicians you know professional musicians have the same conflict at times you know you get into doing this to make the money you have to because we all have to make a living and your musical self and soul is saying oh but i want to go in this direction that there's really no niche for right now and that's avant-garde and and how to hold the two and make space for both you know so much of what can help us hear the voice within is making space for whatever's there it's paradox Right, right. So making space for paradox. And I do remember hearing we have to learn to live within that paradox and that yes. there's no contradictions. There's only paradoxes. Right. All of things I heard in the theater. And, and, and I think I understand that we, these practices, we can bring practices into our lives that don't have to take a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like one thing I tell like I noticed that people, especially people who start the harp later in life, um, they have a lot of nervousness and I, it looks like um, stuttering mm -hmm. when they go to the instrument and like they're trying to get it right. And, and I often suggest, can you put your instrument in a place that is on your way like to the bathroom or the kitchen or mm -hmm. something like that? And then every time you come by it, just, you know, play. Mm -hmm. play something, mm -hmm. even if it sounds terrible at first, even if it sounds like it's all the wrong notes, and go and do this thing and just, just do that every day. Now, I have this pull-up bar in my between two rooms, mm -hmm. and I just do a, one pull-up, you know, a couple of times a day, and I notice that just this tiny thing makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are some things that people could do? We're talking about practicing and practices. So practicing is, well, let's just define these two. Let's define what practicing is. Mm -hmm. I think we, th I think, I think practicing is 
saying there's a thing you want to do, like I do these webinars and, and getting the all, you know, practicing just making sure that all the stuff is in the right place so that people will get the emails of blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, in my school, I always have emails coming out at the wrong time. You know? and, and this is just something I, I actually need to practice every week. I mean, I'm a musician, but this is the thing that, that should be working and I need to practice. Um, and I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't just, I don't be like on Sunday morning, go in, take three minutes to go in and see if this thing is the way you want. Mm -hmm. That's a practice. Mm -hmm. um, but so that's a practice. But practicing is like, for example, I wanted to do a webinar called Meet Your Muse. I really love this webinar. And so I, I usually do webinars once and then you give the replay, but I wanted to do it three times because I knew that in practicing it three times, I'm going to get something out of it that I didn't know. Right. All right. So I feel like I'm just like running around trying to find out um, what is practices what is practicing but why don't i turn it over to you what do you how would you define practicing and practices yeah well you know i think practicing in the sense that we've been talking about it again is that where we have a set structure we're going to do okay, so well, for instance it's better at something right so it's kind of like you say okay I, this is what i'm going to do so every time i go past my harp i'm going to sit down for five minutes and play something that's going to be my, um, and that's my practicing. Well, but but again, like, it becomes a practice right. when I do it with the intention of not just doing it rotely, but doing it in relationally. See, I think so much of the difference between practicing as we're using it in a negative way, because of course, practicing. I'm not saying a negative way because I think I really think it's great. Yeah, yeah. I, I just think but, if it's missing the other, yeah. Yeah, I think again, practicing as we're talking about it this morning is one directional, whereas practices are two directional. Right, and it sounds like like I'm I'm just thinking of all the things I have to do that are often come like I have to do a recording of the musical tomorrow, and so I have to set up the videos and I have mm -hmm. to, you know set up the back screen. I need to make sure, and I notice that as I practice doing this over and over and over again i'm able to create a fluency with it right it also helps if i have a checklist that checklist helps me practice in a more effective way mm -hmm. and yet and yet this what we're doing is a practice because we mm -hmm. set it up that we meet every Friday at this mm -hmm. time, and now it's become easier for me to be a part of it without worrying about mm -hmm. all the things I have to do. Oh, so practices also, it, it, it has to be simple enough. Like you may need to practice something a few times, like the first couple of times I had to figure it out and blah, blah, right. blah. Um, so you may, may have to practice something a certain number of times before we can make a practice, an effective practice of it. Yes, and you're, what you're saying again makes me think about structure. So if I were going to say to people, you know, here is a practice that you could do to just help even know what's going on inside of you, it would be every time you sit down at a meal, before you eat, take a minute to breathe in four breaths with your heartbeat and breathe out to four heartbeats. And just do that for one minute and then do it for two minutes so that the practice to help you begin to even know what's going on inside of you is you every time you go to eat you take a minute you check your pulse you breathe into four heartbeat you breathe out to four heartbeat and you do that for a minute then for two minutes that is a practice that will even begin to bring you back into your body that will begin to help you see what your head is doing and that and the act of doing it will help you come more back to your center. All of that by just being with your breath. And there's lots of research that documents the value of working with the breath um, for stress reduction. You know, you can Google all of that if you're interested. But that's one of my favorite practices is that, you know, just letting myself tune into my heartbeat and breathe into four heartbeats and out the four heartbeats and in to four heartbeats and out to four heartbeats. Oh, so you breathe, you, you, you take your pulse and you, you breathe in for four, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I yeah. See. 
And, and the very act of doing that helps me become aware of what's going on in my body. It helps pull my energy back from the outside activity to me. And um, it helps me attune to my own rhythm physiologically. That's great to attune to your own rhythm. That's yeah. Yeah. And and I I'm also hearing you say that you are connecting it to something that you're going to do anyway. Yes. Absolutely. So you don't have to remember to do it. I mean, you may have to do it, but you don't have to remember. Yeah. And so, so, wow. So that's, that's, that's a practice that we could all take to just become more aware and just tune, tune in. That's right. I'm thinking that a practice, if you are a musician, is pretty much what I've said before, is to find that garden spot before you play. Mm -hmm. And um, I know people are going to ask me, well, what notes are you playing? So I'm just going to say that right now. Um, So this is an F, a C, and a G in in the left hand. Okay. Which you could do on a harp or a piano, whatever. Um, And then it's an A, B, E, and a G. And then I keep my right hand exactly the same, A, B, E, G. And, and, and I take my left hand and put it down to C, G, E. And I could, I could make it simpler if I wanted by just putting an F in the bass and then a C in the bass. And I think one of the reasons that that is emotional for me mm-hmm. is that I'm maintaining the same chord. I hear it. I hear it in a different meaning as I put a different bass note. And so I feel like that kind of creates a rocking almost that gets me connected. Right. So I would say that if you are a musician, any kind of musician, um, that you would find, you know, two things that kind of connect with each other and and then if i guess if you're not a musician again find two things that connect with each other even this for me mm-hmm. you know lets me see like i honestly hadn't really thought about that these two hands are t- really two different hands yeah and um and and one of the things that i've been doing with drawing has been drawing pictures with a left hand side where I kind of see where I think my, my mind is right now mm-hmm. and on the right hand side, how I would like if my mind was more open. So right. I, can, I, I see that for some reason I'm, I'm, what, what are you hearing in that? Well, I think you're, you know, if you're right handed and you're drawn with your right hand, it's dominant, which means it's much more, ego or brain oh. control your left hand is less dominant so it's much more um automatic i hadn't thought about writing with both hands actually i was just writing on the left hand side of the paper but that's a that's a cool thought too yeah yeah so it's 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 given expression you know to, to the part of you that's more structured you have more conscious access to and the part that you have less conscious access to the less conscious access we have the less ability we have to call it up at will. So when people say, oh, if I just had more willpower, well, you know what? There's an illusion there because- Sorry. Oh. I meant to turn that off. Okay, there's an illusion there. There's an illusion there, yeah. And uh, Psyche was just affirming what I was saying there with that little ding. (laughs) Because we're really not just, that's an exact, Example, with willpower, you would have had that turned off, but there were other processes at work. And so I part, a checklist. <laughs> and part of part of living and part of living fully and wholly and as joyfully as possible is learning to live with the mystery and the unknown. And you know, Jung actually says about the psyche, he says, we are a complexio oppositorum. That's Latin for we are a complex of opposites. So when we get it that to live wholly and, pe- and, and with as much joy and peace as possible, then I've got to learn how I'm going to deal with all these opposites in me. You know, we talked a little bit about that last week in relationship to women who end up being, who choose to be mothers and then their careers perhaps take a very different turn that 
there are these opposites within all of our natures and learning to live with them. And, and as Jesus said, gives unto Caesar what is Caesar and unto God what is God. We have to, each of us have to work with those parts of ourselves and say, okay, what's that, how strong is that energy in me and what's it demanding of me in order for me to be able to be at peace with myself? Well, you, as you said, what you just said, I was thinking, oh, you were just talking about that before when you were talking about, um, I feel like, you know, this is the thing I have to do and this is the thing I want to do. Mm -hmm. And um, how do I, um, how do I live with those and, right. uh, and not be constantly this, that, this, that, this, that. And when you did, did you say compository? What did, what did you say? It was a word? complex of opposites. A complex of op opposites. So a complex of opposites. I mean, does that mean that those opposites are balancing us or does it mean they're confusing us? Both. <laughs> I mean, there is a compensatory effect. And again, I, I don't want to take us off too far because right. we're getting close to time to stop today. But um, there, there is a, a balancing effect. For instance, one of the basic principles is that the unconscious is always balancing the conscious attitude. So like what often shows up in night dreams is the other half of what's not conscious about a situation. So there is that balancing. and where we get sick is where we get too one-sided and things get out of balance. Wow, so, so if I was gonna bring this all kind of back together, I'm realizing that the practices, what you're practicing is what you're practicing. Mm -hmm. But the practices are all about making that complex into something, or, or it bring, it is looking at all, being open to all those sides, looking at, and maybe doing one thing and another, because, so you can see that there's one thing and another, and open yourself up to it. That's right. That's right. Okay. All right. So okay. I think I gave my, you know, what I would say to musicians or anybody, which is to do one thing and another mm -hmm. um, as a way of practice, and to be, um, and, and to protect yourself. Meaning if you're playing music, make sure that you're doing it in an environment in which people are not listening to you right. when you're in the midst of a practice. Unless for some reason they're completely at one with you. But even if you were playing for somebody to meditate, um, be careful that you're not worrying about what's going on for them because right. the practice is really to connect to yourself. Right, right. Yeah. And, 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 and you gave the example of the meal, which I think is a really beautiful way to take a pause and connect. Yeah, tech, work with your breath. And if you can't feel your pulse rate, then don't worry about it. Just breathe in to a four count and out to a four count. Okay. And if that's, too, if, that's too, if that's too much, then just start by even becoming aware of the rhythm of your own breathing is your, you know, just being with your breath, watching it. Is it shallow? Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it deep? You know, that in and of itself, that practice, I mean, you can do that at the stoplight. Right. And I'm going to bring in this thing that you said um, for both of these that Jung said, and I won't say it right, so maybe you can, mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter what the thing is. It's all about engaging with it until, what did you say? Well, that it shifts, that by being in relationship to it, something begins to shift in a, in a life-giving direction. Well, that's beautiful. And that is, I think, the heart of what practices are all about. Yeah, absolutely. Kathleen, thank you so much. I was really looking forward to today and, and I, I got everything I was hoping and more out of it. <laughs> and so I'll look forward to seeing you again next week. All right. See you next okay. week. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>